All right, so here's our block back from the machine shop. We've got some fresh bores. Unfortunately, we did have to bore it 20 over or half a millimeter. Um, the crank was also pretty chewed up. It needed turned, so the rods are turned 20 over, the mains are turned 10 over, and the crank was also bent, so it needed straightened back up. The cylinder head was also pretty beat. It needed new guides and just a valve job, so unfortunately we had to do all that, but it's well worth the money, let me tell you. Uh, sometimes you can cobble stuff back together and do a real budget build, but if you've got it apart and you've got the means, it's worth going to the machine shop as much as it sucks. So now that the block is all fresh, it was hot tanked, we need to go ahead and paint it or else it's going to rust. And you can see it's already starting to surface rust up here. So let's go ahead and prep this for paint real quick. All I'm going to do is just degrease it and use a torch to burn out any of the moisture in the block. And then I'm just going to use Rust-Oleum brush on rusty metal primer and then we'll give it some color. Alright, I've gone ahead and sweated the entire block, so now we'll go ahead and mask off everything we don't want to paint. So these bosses will mask off, we'll mask off around the deck. We're brushing, so it's not a huge deal. If you were to spray, then you gotta be a little bit more intentional about what you mask off. So we'll just go through and mask everything off. On the machined edges, kind of a trick, probably that everybody knows. If you uh, put your tape on there, you can get a rubber mallet or a, just a normal hammer or whatever. You can cut the tape at the machined edges, just like that. Makes it kind of quick. Alright, I think that's good enough. We're not going for a masterpiece here. In fact, I don't think you'll need to in fact, I don't think you'll even be able to see the color on the block once it's in the car. So, let's get our primer out and get painting. Here's the stuff I'm using. Try not to go super heavy. Avoid runs. Alright, we've got a good coat of our primer. I think we got mostly full coverage good enough um, so we're gonna go ahead and let this dry and then we can do our color alright so I've let the primer dry overnight we should be good to go ahead and put our color coat on I'm gonna use this red enamel stuff because I already have it and I'm cheap red would not be my choice for this probably black or something but I don't think we're even gonna be able to see the block so I don't really care we're gonna use it alright I'm gonna let that dry probably hit it with another coat um, or two, we'll see, because you can see we still got a little bit of the primer poking through the color, so come back once that's done, and then we can do a final clean of the block and get to assembly. Alrighty, two coats of color, and we're looking good enough for my needs, so we'll go ahead and remove all the masking tape, and then we can do our final clean before assembly. Alright, so we need to go ahead and clean up any of our gasket surfaces that might still have a little bit of residue, even after getting hot tanked. We're going to want to clean out all of our threads, you can see there's some RTV here, especially in the oil pan bolts since it's RTV'd. We also want to clean up the holes for the core plugs. I like to use some fine sandpaper just to prep the surface. Um, and once we have everything cleaned off and all the gasket surfaces are prepped, we'll go ahead and do a final wash with soap and water. Then we should be good to go ahead and start assembly. So I'll get scraping. So most of our gasket surfaces are already pretty clean. The deck doesn't really need any work nor does anything else really. There's a little bit of RTV that needed scraped off of the pan rails. If you're dealing with an engine that hasn't been hot tanked or cleaned at all, then a combination of razor blades and scotch brights your friend. Although if you're going to use scotch bright, you got to make sure you do it before you clean the engine because it sheds aluminum oxide particles. And if you don't, if you aren't really intentional about cleaning that out of your engine, it can cause premature bearing wear. So for the core plugs, I like to use just, this is 100 grit sandpaper. And especially since we didn't mask these off when we paint because we don't really need to, you just want to make sure you get any of the rust or paint out. It just needs to be a, a nice bare steel surface. Not steel, but you get what I mean. All right, so the last thing we really need to do is get all the RTV out of our oil pan threads. Now, ideally, you'd use a thread chaser. We're just going to use a tap. Now, a tap obviously is made to cut threads. A chaser is made to just clean them. What you can actually do is take an old bolt and cut grooves down the sides, and I've done that and they work okay. That's basically what a chaser is. 
I'm just gonna use a tap here. You never wanna use a tap on something critical like the mains or the head bolts. You never chase threads with the tap. That'll ruin them. You can get away with it, but it's not good. It can weaken the threads, so just don't ever do it. Something like the oil pan bolts will be fine. Just cleaning them up with a tap. See how the thread we pulled out there. All right, let's go ahead and do the final wash now. I like to just use soap and water from a garden hose and a brush. I mean, most of the cleaning's done for us already since it was hot tank. We just want to make sure there's no residual metal or anything from machining in the oil galleries. And we'll also just do a final flush of the cooling jackets. We'll need to hit the bores with a uh, solvent because after the honing process, a lot of metal can stay in the, uh, the cross hatch, but usually my machinist is pretty good about cleaning it out, which is nice, but, but we'll give it a wipe down with a solvent rag and make sure that there's nothing left in the bores. The biggest thing is gonna be the oil passages. This block is already really clean, so it's probably about as far as we really need to go. Just making sure all the passages are clear. We're gonna wanna dry this with an air gun, an air compressor. And then I like to spray it down with WD just to make sure it's not gonna flash rust. You can rub it down with oil or anything really. All right, there we go. Now we're just about ready to start assembly. All right, now that we've got our block cleaned for assembly, we're gonna to wanna to be careful to keep it covered so that no dust or dirt or anything gets onto it. And I like to use these big trash bags. They work really well. Let's go over our parts selection real quick. So our crankshaft needed ground. You can see there we got 20 on the rods, 10 on the mains. So we needed to make sure that we got the proper oversized main and rod bearings. Speaking of our rods, our rods were completely chewed up from that one spun bearing and the rest of them were not looking very good. So I wasn't able to find any stock replacements really. So I just went with the cheapest aftermarket rods. I think it's like 300 bucks for this set, which is a pretty decent deal. And if I ever end up doing some kind of forced induction in the future, which I'm considering doing maybe a junkyard supercharger on this thing, potentially, so keep an eye out for that. These will more than handle that. The stock rods are fine for anything I would do, but whatever, we're putting these in. And for our pistons and the entire rebuild kit, I went with the DNJ kit, which is a reputable enough company. They're just a perfectly fine stock replacement. If you were doing any crazy turbo or anything like that, you'd maybe want to consider going with forged pistons, but these are just your regular cast style pistons, 50 mil or 0.5 millimeter over or 20 thousandths over. These are just like the stock ones, so they're gonna do fine for us. We also needed to make sure we got the proper oversized rings. Since our cylinder bores are oversized, the DNJ kit was a pretty reasonable price. I think it was like, I don't know, 300 bucks or something like that for everything, including the pistons which I was having a hard time finding stock style replacement pistons too. So the DNJ kit seems to be pretty decent quality. We'll see how it does. And I, so far I'd recommend it. So now we are ready to go ahead and get our crank into the block. But before we do that, we gotta get our piston squirters in that shoot oil at the bottom of the piston skirts to cool everything off. So here they are, they need cleaned up. And I think some styles have copper rings that go on either side. They didn't have any coming off, so I don't think we need to put them on. It's not like we need a crazy seal since they're just gonna leak back into the crankcase anyways. We need to clean all these up and speaking of any parts that weren't hot tank to the machine shop, the oil pan, the timing cover, anything like that, I basically just do the same treatment as the block. Soapy water, pressure washer, if they're really gunked up, purple power or super clean, it's a kind of heavy degreaser and it's just a lot of elbow grease. I'm not going to show any of that since it's just basically mindless repetition. All right, so here's our piston squirters. Made sure to get them really clean. One thing is on an engine like this that spun a, a bearing, you really, really need to do deep cleaning on all the parts. A bunch of metal shavings came out of even these, and that would be bad news in our new engine. So everything needs cleaned super, super well. If you're just doing a... Uh, you know, rebuilding a tired motor, it's not as critical because there won't be little metal shavings throughout, but I mean, obviously you still want to spend a good amount of time getting them clean, but with a with metal suspended everywhere, bad news. 
These are 14 millimeters and they get torqued to right around 10 foot pounds, so nothing crazy. So before we set the main bearings in, we want to clean the back side of the bearings, the saddle of the, the mains, really, really well. We want to get all the oil off, any contaminants, because any raised spot is not going to allow the bearing to sit down properly and it will make a tight spot. So you want to make sure that this is really clean. No lint, too, that's important. Coffee filters work okay for this kind of thing. They don't really shed any lint. We're also going to want to check to make sure that the threads are all good, so we'll thread a bolt in through all of these. If there's any kind of resistance, we'll want to run a chaser through. I'm going to blow these holes out. There's still some water in them, or a WD. So obviously we need to make sure the oil hole lines up with the oil hole. It's easy because tang goes into the tang retainer. Alright, so we're going to need to check our bearing clearance with the crank for sure, so especially since we're going oversize. Always good practice to do it. If you've got inside and outside micrometers, you can measure the outside of the crank and the inside of the bearing shells. We're going to use plastic gauge. Since we already know the crank's good, it was freshened up, we just gotta check the overall bearing clearance. So we can go ahead and lube up the lower shells. I like to use just assembly lube. If you're gonna run the engine right away, you can use motor oil. We also need to put our thrust bearings in. So this style, this engine has these style thrust washers that actually just sit on independently. What I like to do is throw a dab of assembly lube or whatever on the back to try to get it to stick to the block. Obviously you want these tabs out, they hold oil. Go ahead and set our crank in place. Now before you actually put the crank in, it needs cleaned really well too because all of these holes are traps for oil. They're drilled in like this. On this particular motor, uh, each side of the rods and the mains are drilled through, and then there's one that's drilled that way. So you want to like plug one side, blow the air through, put solvent through. I got a bunch of junk out of this one, especially because it was ground, so a lot of the machine dust gets in there. And if you don't do that, then your bearings are going to be immediately chewed up. Not good stuff, so definitely do that whenever you're building an engine. So the main caps are numbered and directional. There's a number sta stamped in there even though it's kind of faded and hard to see. But the arrow points forward obviously and just like the block side you want to make sure this is totally clean and free of lint. Alright so we can go ahead and put our plastic gauge on all of our main journals. The factory spec is 7 to 14 tenths. That's ten thousandths of an inch. So if we're right around one thousandth of clearance, that would be just about right. And no lube yet. Though we do want to oil our bolts. Otherwise you won't get an accurate torque spec. Alright, and then the torque spec on the mains is 43 foot-pounds, 40 to 43. We'll kind of want to work our way around in steps. Alright, now we pop them all off and see how we're doing. Looks like we've got a 2,000th clearance, so a little bigger than spec. Let's see how the other ones are. So it's looking like we've got 2,000s across all the mains, which is going to be fine. That's a little 
looser than OEM spec, but that's not a problem. It's like six tenths out of spec, and especially in more high performance applications, guys will run up to two and a half thousands, I think. So this is not going to give us any trouble. I like to scrape the plastic edge off. You don't really have to. Technically, you can just leave it. But I don't know. Right now, we can go ahead and get our main caps on there and torqued for good. Go ahead and torque these all down. I like to mark the bolts after they're torqued. Alright, I just want to make sure it rotates nice and free. Yep, we're all good. Alright, so we can go ahead and put our pistons together. So, we've got new rods. So obviously we need to put our pistons on the rods. Our pistons are sized for their bore. You can see this one's cylinder four. So we're gonna have to make sure we pay attention to that. The rods aren't directional. You can see they're chamfered on both sides. Doesn't really matter, but we'll keep them all the same. So we'll have, this is the front, so we'll have it go like that. These pistons came with circlips, snap rings, actually. So I like to install one side first. You really want to make sure these are seated right, for obvious reasons. We'll lube up our wrist pin bushing. We just put engine oil on the, on the piston. We gotta get our other circle clip in. There we go. Now we're just gonna do that three more times. All right. So now we gotta check our piston ring gaps. This is probably the most tedious part. We only have four cylinders here, which is pretty nice. Piston ring gap is one thing you gotta consider. If you're just doing a stock rebuild, then no big deal. Just go off the OEM specs. If you're considering maybe putting boost into it at some point in the future, you really ought to open up the piston ring gap. You're not really leaving any power on the table by opening it up in an NA application to a point, obviously. But if you open it up a little bit, no big deal. And you're safer down the road if you ever decide to put a boost into it. I may end up doing a little bit of a mild supercharger kind of deal on this engine. So we're going to open up the piston ring. The top ring we're going to open up to six thousandths per inch of bore so that's going to leave us at a 20 th at a 20 thousandth top ring gap and five thousandths per inch of bore for the second ring so that's going to leave us at about 17 thousandths for our second ring gap and then the oil ring is no big deal as long as you got i don't know like 15 thousandths of clearance you're good so we got to go through and check each ring on each cylinder and probably we're going to need to file them to fit. So I've got molly rings. You can see the top ring has this molly face here. I think you can only really get molly or chrome rings for these Miata motors. Old engines you can get cast rings and they're a lot more forgiving but not as friendly to power adder. So the molly rings are kind of my go-to <clears throat> because they're not too spendy and chrome rings you got to have a really specific cylinder wall finish. These molly rings are pretty forgiving. So start here with cylinder one. Oh yeah, we're going to need to file it open. So you want to square up the ring with your piston. And I did misspeak, it's a conversion factor of 5 thousandths on the top and 5 5 thousandths on the lower, the second. So that, that leaves us with a 17 thousandths gap on the top ring and about 18 thousandths gap on the second ring. So we're tighter than that right now, so we'll need to sand this down a little bit. So this is just a fairly cheap 
ring grinder, it works. You just want to take a little bit off at a time, put it back in and check, and make sure all the rings are in spec, and you want to keep the rings on their respective cylinders that you measured them in. So I'm just going to go through, do that, and come back once they're all done. Alright, so all of our rings are gapped. Now we need to go and put them on their respective pistons. So this is piston 4. Now different ring manufacturers have different steps. Most of it's universal that the writing on the ring goes up or if there's like a step on the ring that goes down. So you can see here this is these particular piston rings. You see there, all any marks must go up. So these particular piston rings, that's how they go. So I like to start with the expander oil ring. Then you do the lower rail. Top rail. Second ring, which is just normal cast iron. You can see this one has a step. That step goes down. And finally our top ring, which is bi-directional really, but we'll go with the writing up. And it's as simple as that. Now, a lot of guys freak out about orienting ring gaps and all that. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Um, the rings all spin when they're actually riding up and down on the bores. Basically, I just make sure they're not all lined up. So, so I basically just make sure second ring's over here, top ring's over here, no biggie. And then we'll put some oil on these before we install them. I'm going to go ahead and put the rings on the rest of the pistons. Alright, now we're ready to put our pistons in. I like to put the crank at bottom dead center of whatever piston we're putting in. And since this is a four cylinder, we have two at bottom dead center. We have one and four, so we can do both of them and then rotate. I did make sure the bores are completely free of any metal. I get a rag soaked with acetone or brake cleaner or whatever solvent and it should come off completely clean when you wipe it all the way around the cylinder. So our pistons have a dot on the front that's going to face towards the front of the engine. And we also want to make sure the caps on the rods go, this, go on the correct way. You can see they go tang to tang. So just like the mains, we want to make sure the bearing, saddle, or whatever you want to call it, is completely clean of any oil or contaminants. Then we can put our bearing in. We're going to want to pre-lube this side. We're going to have to check the clearance. So we will not lube the other side until we've done that. And I like to lube up the pistons generously. Put some in the rings just to help slide it through the compressor. And go ahead and compress the rings. You want to make sure they don't pop out of the grooves at all. And down she goes. Seat the ring compressor onto the block deck. It shouldn't take hardly any pressure to get it down. Just some firm taps. And you'll want to guide the end of the rod onto the crank because you don't want it to hit the crank and score it up. You see the sound change? These are bottomed out. So now we'll go ahead and put our plastic gauge on. Our bearing cap. Now these rods have ARP hardware in them and they have special torque specs that have to be done with ARP Molly Lube on the fasteners. So we'll go ahead and put some on the threads, also under the heads. Since these are aftermarket, our torque spec is going to be different. We've got ARP 2000 bolts on here, I believe, yep. So the torque is going to be 26 foot-pounds with the loop. These are six-point bolts, they're 10 millimeter. If you're reusing the stock rods, then the torque spec is 35 foot-pounds. You do want to oil the bolts with just straight motor oil. You're going to want to be careful not to rotate the crank as we tighten. Otherwise, that can mess up our plastic gauge measurement. 
These rod caps fit pretty tight on these aftermarket rods, so it might be kind of a pain to get it out. I think maybe what we'll do is thread these bolts in a ways and just lightly tap on them. See if we can get them to separate. So now we're going to check our clearance. I believe one and a half to two and a half thousandths is what we're looking for. And we are dead on two thousandths. So number one is completely fine. I'm going to go through and check all those. We can put number one's cap back on and torque it to spec. Make sure it rotates free. Rotates very free. Now one measurement I neglected to take, which we should have taken before we even put this piston in, is crankshaft end plate. Now having it in there is not going to affect us, but if we need to adjust it, then we have to take that out. So let's set up our dial indicator. You can also use a feeler gauge between the crank and the thrust bearing but we have a few we have a dial indicator so we'll go ahead and smack the crank back set up our dial indicator now that we've got our dial indicator set up we can go ahead and measure our end play it's zeroed out so go ahead and pry the crank back that's zero put it that way Looks like we've got just about seven and a half. The uh, limit is three thousandths to eleven or twelve thousandths is the service limit. So we're right in that range. We're good to run it. Now I'm going to go ahead and get all of our pistons installed. All right, we've got all of our pistons in. All the clearances checked out fine. All at two thousandths. Turn it nice and free. Beautiful. So there's our short block together. Now we can keep moving forward. All right, next up we can go ahead and get our oil pump on. I'm replacing it because who knows how much metal ran through the oil pump, obviously a lot. So I'm sure the rotors are all gouged up. I'm gonna go ahead and pop the cover off this one just so we can verify that it's in good shape and that all the machine work is done properly on it. So you can see our rotor here moves very freely. We just wanna make sure there's nothing too weird on here. If you're inspecting a used oil pump for reuse, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with reusing an oil pump as long as it's in good shape. You just wanna look for any weird wear on these rotors. If there's any gouges or anything, you might as well just replace it. They're cheap enough. And it's kind of critical. They're really pretty simple. Obviously these just squeeze together and create pressure. This pump looks fine, so we will lubricate it up. Use some assembly lube, just because it's nice and tacky. I think I'm going to put a dab of Loctite on these screws just for peace of mind. Don't need a ton. Alright, and then the torque spec on these Phillips head bolts is 53 to 78 foot-pounds. which is not a ton, so if you don't have a inch-pound torque wrench, just, you know, make sure they're tight. Unfortunately, our new oil pump is a slightly different design than our old one. You can see the old one has a large boss here. The new one has a little bit of a smaller boss. So, that must have been a change from the earlier BP motors to the BP4W which is what this is where the earlier ones used a shorter boss like this so I'm gonna have to get a bolt that is this size to thread into here so I'll have to get that we need to let this uh, silicone tack up anyways for about an hour before we can torque it down to its final spec alright so here's our shortened bolt I went ahead and just cut it down 
And the keen-eyed among you may have noticed that the keyway in this crank is a little wallowed out. And unfortunately, I missed that on disassembly and the machine shop missed that while they were doing their thing. Which it happens, but um, that's a pretty common thing. That's kind of the root of the, the short nose crank issue that I'm sure a lot of the Miata enthusiasts or whatever have heard about. Where the 1.6s in 90 and 91 had a shorter nose crank than even this. And that caused issues because there wasn't a whole lot of engagement with the keyway. And really the keyway doesn't do any load bearing. It's kind of just there for alignment on assembly. But what happens is people mess up torquing the crank bolt and all of the load is then transferred from the stretch of the bolt to the keyway, which is what happened here. Somebody, some doofus, didn't torque the bolt right probably and unfortunately the keyway is wallowed out. This is pretty mild as far as that issue goes. I wish I would have caught it before I, you know, dumped a whole bunch of money into this crank, but it is what it is. Luckily the passenger, or actually the driver's side of the keyway is fine. So when we assemble, we just need to make sure we hold it that way. And then we can torque the bolt down and that should hold it in. We just have to be really, we have to make sure we get the bolt torqued. I think the root of the problem is probably because people try to torque it in gear. And when you torque it with the car in gear, the springs on the clutch take up some of the torque force and you don't get an accurate torque reading from your torque wrench. So that's what I'm guessing is kind of the problem. It's kind of a, I'm not going to say a bad design, it's a, an unfortunate design, I guess, because there's no taper on the crank, and if the bolt at all fails, then it's all to the keyway, which isn't even long enough. So, not a huge deal. I think we're going to reinforce it with some Loctite around the snout of the crank. There is kind of a repair that people do with a special... Loctite, I think it's 660, where you put the key in and fill it up with Loctite and let it cure. I can understand that if you have a really worn keyway with this. I don't think it's necessary because again, it doesn't, it's not designed to be load bearing. Once we get the bolt torqued down, that should be holding all of the force from the crank to the crank pulley. And the uh, medium strength thread locker that we put on the crank should help with that. We're also going to make sure to put thread locker on the crank bolt. But anyways, let's go ahead and torque these bolts down. It's been about an hour. We can go ahead and torque our oil pan bolts down. The torque is 14 to 18 foot-pounds. And we'll try to snug them up kind of evenly. Alright, there we go. Alright, so one more thing we got to do in the oil pump. We've got this hole here that is the dipstick hole for front-wheel drive applications on this engine. This is the plug that I drove out of our old oil pump. We're going to go ahead and reuse it. I'm going to put just a little skim coat of RTV on it just to help retain it and seal. We shouldn't need that because it's an interference fit, but I am reusing it, which is probably not ideal. Yeah, we're going to need a new plug. You know what? I think we're just going to go ahead and use two part epoxy. Alright, here we go. It's just your standard five minute two part epoxy. I mean, we don't need anything fancy. Just needs to seal oil, not even under pressure. They're just starting to harden up. I think this is some old stuff too, so hopefully it does okay. Alright, before we get our oil pan on, we gotta get the rear main seal back on. This housing is kind of chewed up, and I don't know why. You can see, the flex plate or the flywheel or something's been riding against it and kind of chewing up the housing. I think it's okay to reuse it, pop the seal and clean it and make sure it's still straight and everything. Someone also messed up the installation of the seal, so it's all crooked. Or I guess it could be whatever was hitting pushed the seal in. I don't I don't really know honestly. Kind of funky. So I'm gonna prop this up. And we'll knock the seal out. Alright, I went ahead and cleaned up our rear main housing. I don't know why it's all chewed up here. 
the important parts are still intact, but that is a little suspect. We're going to want to look into what was causing that, especially on the crank side of things. So we just got to drive this in. goes this way. Lip in. I like to kind of do a super small skim coat of RTV on the outside. Helps lube it up just a little bit and is just a little bit of an extra protection against leaks around the outside. The tricky thing with these is you got to work them in even. Now there's special tools, but obviously I don't have it. So we use a block of wood. That's actually going in really easy, which is kind of weird. Usually you got to pound it in. Oh, you know what? Since the uh, housing's worn away here, it looks flat here, but it's actually in crooked. So we're going to have to be really careful with that. Maybe we will go to the inside of this little chamfer here and do that all the way around so that we know that it's square. Because if it's not square, it's not going to seal right against the crank. Alright, so both this sealing surface on the seal housing and the block need to be degreased. I already did it. So now we can go ahead and put our RTV on. Do you want to oil up the inner lip of the seal? And it's going to be a little awkward because we got it on the engine stand, but we got to fish this down in here. Not get the RTV or anything. You want to make sure the lip goes over the crank properly, doesn't get folded. And then there's little alignment dowels. There we go. Alright, and the longer ones go up here. So we're just going to finger tighten these, let it dry for an hour, then we'll torque it down to spec. Torque spec is 69 to 95 inch pounds. So next step is our oil pan, and I started cleaning it. You can see there's still a lot of metal that we need to get out. And I noticed the wonderful previous owner also stripped out the drain plug and used one of these self-tapper plugs. You see how janky it is? Not good. So we're going to drill this out and tap it to the next metric size, which is M20 by 1.5, I believe. Pretty big drain plug, but we've got enough meat that we can make it work. We're just going to need a big drill bit. All right, so here's our new plug. We just want to make sure there's enough meat on the, on the pan for the seal, and it looks like we have just enough. This is going to work nice, as long as we can get the hole straight and actually tap it right. So the M20 by 1.5, we need an 185 millimeter drill bit. Big thing. Oh yeah, it fits in our little hand drill. Kind of comical. Alright, we'll see what happens. Can't use a drill press or anything like that, because obviously it's on a weird angle. Just hope it kind of self-centers. Ugh, drills out of battery. There we go, drills fighting us a little bit, so the hole's a little wonky plus feels like the threads cut pretty deep so there's still a little bit of the old self tapper in there but I think it'll be okay unfortunately I don't have a tap handle big enough for this tap so we're gonna use a wrench not ideal but be careful about playing even pressure It's hard without a tap handle because it's really easy to get it to pull out to a side. Probably should have cut a little bit of lube on it, but it's aluminum. Okay, well, we have threads. Hopefully, they're good enough. Look pretty good. <laughs> 
All right, let's try to throw our plug in. There we go. Looks like the whole drill is a little cattywampus, unfortunately, but that's what the gasket's for, right? Maybe not, because it's not even sealing. Oh yeah, shoot. See here? The hole was drilled, you know, off center. <sighs> well, it looks like if we tighten it down enough, it seals, but definitely not something I want to gamble on because if this ends up leaking and we, I don't know, either need to drill another size over, which I don't even know if we have enough meat to do that or swap the pan, that's a big job to do in the car. So we might as well try to make sure it's all good to go while it's outside the car because once it's in there, it's going to be a nightmare. All right, so I was able to clean up the threads enough that the plug's going in enough and it's sealing. I think we're going to be okay. I had it filled with water for a, quite a while and no leaks. If we run into any issues, we can change out that little fiber washer for a rubber washer that maybe takes up a little bit more slack or an O-ring. But I think we're going to be okay on that. Worst case, we just have to pull the motor again, right? No big deal. I also went ahead and cleaned up the oil pan. This was probably the most time-consuming piece to clean because all the metal oil, the fine metal dust in the oil, got into the aluminum pores, and, and it took pressure washing, uh, brake cleaner and rag, and then air compressor, and and doing that a whole bunch of times before we got it to this point. Now we're good, there's no more metal in there. We're gonna give it a quick blast with the air gun just to make sure there's nothing that's settled in there. Then we'll get our little baffle plate in that the pickup goes through. I got to say, I did use Scotch-Brite, and that's a big reason why you need to do a final rinse because Scotch-Brite sheds aluminum oxide powder. Scotch-Brite's awesome, don't get me wrong, but if you don't clean up the dust it sheds, then it will mess up the engine. Then I'm going to put Loctite on these little bolts. Ideally with that messed up drain plug, I'd just replace the pan, but unfortunately I don't have a new one, so we're just going to use this for now. I'm going to torque these to 90 inch pounds, just like the rest of these 10 millimeter headed, 10 millimeter headed bolts. So now for our windage tray, I went ahead and cleaned it up with a wire wheel just to get all the, well, most of the RTV off. The rest we're going to scrape off with just a razor. And then this got kind of bent up because the RTV adheres so well to the block that you kind of got to bend it up to get it to break the bond. So we're going to flatten it out just with our ball peen or whatever. All right, so now that we got this straightened out, we're ready to go ahead and seal it to the block. So we need to clean every surface, every mating surface, so both sides of the windage tray, the block, and the oil pan, and make sure they're free of oil because we're going to be using RTV. So this windage tray goes on first. We're just gonna seal around the bolt holes and along the perimeter. All right, so now I go ahead and set this down, lining up the bolt holes. All right, so next up is our oil pickup. So this, of course, I cleaned out very well. You wanna spray high pressure water through and blast everything out because any metal that's trapped in here goes immediately to the bearings. So definitely wanna clean that really well. There is a little paper gasket that goes onto the oil pump inlet. Put a little Loctite on them for good measure. And all of these bolts and the one nut have a torque spec of 75 to 90 foot pounds, or inch pounds. Don't do foot pounds, that'd be bad. Or just, you know, mostly finger tight. Not finger tight, snug. See, it kind of lifted our windage tray up a little bit. Probably because we had to get a little brutal with this when we were taking it apart and I think that's just because the uh, the bond between the windage pan and the block was so strong so it was really hard to actually break the seal but once you get the oil pan pressed down onto here we should be 
golden. So before we get our pan on, we need to coat the bridge or whatever you want to call it here in RTV. And then we've got these little rubber seals that go across. The kit came with a few of them. The only ones that fit are these three. This is the rear one. See there. And then these two both fit, but I think we want to go with a thinner one. Otherwise, we're going to have uneven sitting downage. So, since. <clears throat> So we'll go with this one since it's about the same thickness as the rear one. I'm also going to cut off the partially cured RTV from putting the rear main on just so it doesn't interfere with this. Having the oil pan sit down. Go ahead and put these rubber seals on. Alright, I went ahead and ran a bead all the way around our oil pan. We'll go ahead and set her down. All right, now we just need to go around the perimeter and put our bolts in. We're just gonna snug them for now, let the RTV dry, and then we'll come back and torque them to spec. All right, so it's been about an hour. Now we can snug all of the bolts up to their final spec of 70 to 95 inch pounds. We'll wanna kinda snug them up in stages and work from the center out. All right, so with that, I think we just about have our short block buttoned up. Next time we'll be getting the cylinder head on and the timing belt and everything, and that'll get us basically to where we're ready to put it back in the car. So yeah, we made good progress, and I will see you then.